Well, hello and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. Thanks for joining us today. We are going to have a marvelous show, I think, with some really, really interesting conversation. Um, for those of you that are new to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Lori LeBay, and I'm the host and founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. And basically, I got into this space um, kind of backwards, which I think most people do when it comes to dementia. Um, my mom was diagnosed uh, with Alzheimer's disease and lived with uh, dementia sy- symptoms for over 30 years, so more than half of my life. And I just decided um, to try to make a difference and try to share some of the knowledge that I've learned and to um, also raise people's voice, um, I think is just critical. So Alzheimer's Speaks as a whole is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift dementia care from crisis to comfort around the world. And we just truly believe that by sharing um, everyday conversations like we're going to have today, that we're going to be able to help remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help people who are living and dealing with this disease continue to live their lives with purpose and to be engaged in family and community and friends. And so, again, I, I really appreciate you all joining us here today. Um, the other thing I have to thank our audience for is really helping raise Alzheimer's Speaks profile. You see, we believe that collaboratively is the only way we're going to win this battle against dementia. And I know that that philosophy is working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares with your Twitter tribes, your your LinkedIn um, groups and colleagues, your Facebook friends, um, even on Pinterest, all the different social media. You know, when you when you like our show, um, or our website, or the dementia chats that we do, or a blog, you're pushing it out to your sphere of influence. And so many times there are people in our own circles that we have no idea are dealing with this disease and these symptoms. And the more we push it out, uh, the more comfortable people are going to feel grabbing hold of that information when the time is right for them. And because of all your clicks and shares that you've done, um, you got us recognized as the number one influencer online regarding Alzheimer's, according to Share Care and Dr. Oz. And so I, you know, I just hope that you'll continue um, to spread the word. You know, here we like to interview all parties. So from those who are diagnosed to their loved ones and care partners um, who are caring for them to advocates and professionals alike. And today um, is going to be a really interesting show because we're going to be talking with a woman who had a brain injury and a lot of her symptoms were very similar to dementia and um, how, how it felt um, to kind of live in that cloud and trying to communicate with people and and um, process things and, and still be who you are. So I think it's going to be really very fun. We also um, have two experts um, who are actually diagnosed with dementia who will be talking with us as well and uh, sharing their insights, um, kind of uh, symptoms of Um, brain injury versus actual dementia symptoms. So I'll introduce them in in just a minute. Uh, But before I do that, I always like to give a shout out to a couple of um, sponsors. One is the Purple Angel Project. Um, If you're not familiar with the Purple Angel, it's a new global symbol for dementia. It's in over 17 different countries. It's free. All you have to do is go to alzheimerspeaks.com if you're here in the U.S., and uh, go to initiatives and programs, and you'll be able to uh, read a little bit more about it and also click on something asking for information for that. Um, another uh, organization I want to give a big shout-out to is Health Star Home Health, which is here locally in Minnesota, who just does amazing work. Uh, they have trained their staff as the Alzheimer's Whispers. They're extremely active in the community and trying to make a difference. And um, I just love them to the core. Uh, The other one I want to mention is Alzheimer's Disease International. A lot of people don't even know that there is an international organization of all the Alzheimer's associations. And not only can you go there to find out who's closest to you, but you can also find out great global um, information and research there. Uh, A lot of people refer to them as ADI, but uh, again, if you just Google Alzheimer's Disease International. And then before I introduce our guests, I'm just going to give a shout out to two of my 
um, colleagues here, um, different programs at Alive and Social. And the first is Apples to Apples. And Apples to Apples is a sports show featuring a father and son, um, Scott and Drew Applebaum. And they're kind of a hoot to listen to. They have, uh, they have a following uh, that's quite large. I, I believe they refer to themselves as the Apple Grove. And um, they are on Mondays at 2.30. And there you can kind of find out if Father really knows best, you know, with their bantering back and forth. The second show I just want to um, make people aware of is called Mortgages and BS. And there you're going to find on Thursdays at 4 o'clock um, great information about local, um, local mortgages with Tom Smith. And you're also going to hear from uh, radio personality uh, um, BT. And they'll discuss more than just mortgages and home ownership. They get into, um, you know, everyday events that are going on around the world as well. Um, but again, lots of great information and resources as well as uh, some fun, fun banter there. So let me go ahead and introduce our guest today. Suzanne Rabus um, is a wellness consultant and coach who combines her experience in mental health education corporate training, and legacy structuring with her personal understanding of recovering from a brain injury. Um, her recent experience has been with veterans and also a dear friend diagnosed with cognitive impairment and PST, uh, uh, PTSD. And um, she is really a person who seeks to inspire um, people and in the possibilities for caregivers and those in the community that are dealing with any type of disability. And uh, I think you're going to find her conversation really um, fun and expire, um, inspiring, expiring, I was going to say. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, no, inspiring, inspiring. So welcome, Suzanne. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Well, good. In addition to Suzanne, um, we have two of our experts from the Dementia Chats uh, program that we do, which is a webinar we do on the second and fourth Tuesday. And both Harry Urban and Michael Ellen Bogan are diagnosed with dementia, and they just are profound in terms of their insights and their ability to communicate what it's like to have dementia and how to really help people live um, as well as possible and, um, you know, maneuver through kind of the minutia sometimes that, you know, on any of our journeys, you know, we have. And uh, they just bring such hope and advocacy. So welcome, Harry. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Uh, well, I'm having a good day today. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, good, good. And Michael, how are you doing? Doing really good, Lori. Thank you uh, for having me here. Well, good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and um, start just asking um, Suzanne some basic questions, and then I'll be pulling you guys in um, to see what your thoughts are, because I, I think there's going to be a lot of overlap in terms of symptoms, and there's probably going to be some differences as well. And I, I just think, you know, the more we can talk about all this, the, the better off we'll be. So, Suzanne, um, for yourself, in terms of, I always ask guests, uh, you know, have you been personally touched by dementia with family or friends that have actually mm -hmm. been diagnosed with the disease? Right. And um, most recently, a, a dear friend of mine, um, about four years ago, just started be, behaving differently. Just didn't seem to be quite herself. And... Over the next couple of years, I, I noticed this, but um, didn't seem to put two and two together that there was really something going on. It's kind of hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and also wanting to be respectful as a friend, um, I just started to realize I needed to have a few conversations with her. Because at times, I almost took it, took it personally. And so I, I learned I had to ask her questions. One of those was, have I done something to offend you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because she wasn't, wasn't calling me like she used to. And when we did talk on the phone, she didn't seem to want to talk so much. And we used to talk on the phone all the time. So this was a real change. When I finally had that conversation, she used less words to say, no, you haven't offended me. Mm -hmm. And she was, she said, no, everything's fine. 
about like that. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I accepted what she said, and we j- I just realized that she didn't talk as much on the phone as she used to. But little by little, I noticed other things, like her car started to show damage. Mm-hmm. And she was a good driver previously. <laughs> um, and there were other things that happened, too. Um, and she wasn't as social. She stopped attending some of the events that we usually went to. So um, we had some additional conversations where, um, and it was scary for me, and I told her that. Uh, I I let her know from the beginning of the conversation that I was hoping this wouldn't, that she wouldn't be upset and that this wouldn't hurt our friendship. But I, um, I just let her know, this is what I've been noticing. Have you been noticing anything too? Mm Mm-hmm. And she started to get more honest with me about it and tell me, because she didn't want to talk about it previously, or she would have. Okay. Um, I'm going to just throw over to uh, Harry and then to Michael. Um, In terms of how a friend handles that, it sounds to me like it was kind of a nice way that you were trying to be supportive and yet honest. Mm -hmm. Um, Harry, what are your thoughts in terms of being a person with dementia? Because I know so many times people say, you know, friends and family kind of fall by the wayside and you can't always have honest conversations with them. Um, what are your thoughts about for a friend who is maybe noticing some signs? What What is a good way to be able to approach that topic? I, I think you have to realize, Lori, now living this disease, um, we, get, we get very quiet because as a, as a disease progresses, we kind of turn inward mm-hmm. to ourselves and we do that because we feel safe that's a mm-hmm. safe place for us now when when somebody else looks at us they might think that we might be standoffish or, or we don't want anything to do with with them but that's not that's not the case at, at all it's it's we we grew within ourselves and we feel safe there and we're hesitant to come out. Now, in, in order for me to come out, you have to be gentle in in getting me to come out. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it does to me. Okay. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it it does actually. And and because I we were such good friends. And I let her know that I was scared to talk to her about it, but that I wanted to because as a friend, that was the thing to do. Um, she seemed to open up more. And and then I got to tell her how grateful I was for trusting me. Wonderful. Um, Michael, how about you? How do you think friends should approach this this topic? Any advice? Well, well I think what Harry said, I agree with. Uh, I, I think it's become very important that for anybody who has this disease that they address the situation by speaking to the person and to try to get a better understanding and ask specific questions like how is this affecting you and and how would you like me to deal with you and things like that because I don't think most of us who have this will freely come out and talk about it. But I do encourage people to ask me uh, so they can learn from it. And I think that's the key thing. Uh, it's it's up to the other person to guide us through those steps to get the information they need. Okay, great. That's a really good point too. Um, because when I when I started asking questions, she was always willing to answer me. It just wasn't something like you said that would automatically come up. Mm-hmm. So, Suzanne, can you tell us a little bit, you know, we, we have you on the show here to kind of talk about brain injury, which mm-hmm. you had. Can you tell people um, a little bit about yourself and your brain injury? And Sure. Um, and, and mine, you know, every brain injury is, is different. So that's, I, I want to make sure that, that I, I state that because what happened to me and, and how it affected me is not what's going to happen for everyone. Um, also, I am not an expert. I am just a person who ended up um, driving to work one day and got rear-ended at a stoplight. And, um, and I was actually knocked out. I was, um, for a short period of time, but my eyes were open, which I didn't even know was possible. So I didn't realize how severe the actual impact was. Mm -hmm. Um, but it impacted me obviously right away. And, I went back to work that very day after leaving the emergency room, but I wasn't myself. I just stood at the window. And 
I was in my office by myself, so nobody really noticed what was happening. And um, what they say with brain injury is that when you have a concussion, which I did have, that you need to rest. But nobody told me that that day because I don't know that they did enough tests to really find out that I had a, a concussion and that it was as severe as it turned out to be. The um, brain injury for, for me actually impacted me in su such an extreme way that I ended up leaving work. I had to take a leave of absence because projects that I had designed, I didn't understand why we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that afternoon of uh, the day that, that it happened, I couldn't get on the computer. I didn't remember how to do that anymore. So I had immediate memory loss, which is um, real common. And it was both short-term and long-term because I also couldn't remember my parents' phone numbers. Another thing I've found out recently is that brain injuries get worse over time. Um, so uh, I wish I'd known that at the time because I saw it happening and it just got real scary for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thing, I think injuries were handled a little differently back when mine happened. It was 25 years ago. So mm -hmm. um, times have changed, which is good. And there are many more... Um, services that actually help people when they have that kind of an injury. But do you want, do you want a couple other examples of what yeah, happened with me? that'd be great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I told you I couldn't remember my parents' phone numbers, which they'd had for like 10, 20 years, <laughs> something like that. But um, I didn't recognize people anymore. I would go grocery shopping and set things on the, on the counter and then um, go to bed and come out the next day and all the meat would be ruined. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't understand social cues the way I used to. I stopped being able to handle being in a room of several people. And I used to train people all over the country and I, I did presentations for hundreds of people sometimes. <laughs> so these were big changes for me. Uh, I also started to get scared of traveling and I noticed one day in fact, this might be one of the best examples I can give you about how the brain slows down. I was driving um, home from an appointment, and as I was driving, I realized something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so I just went, hmm, something's not right here. Hmm. Oh, there's a car coming toward me. Hmm. I wonder if I should move. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if I'm on the wrong side of the road. Hmm. I think I am. Hmm. I think I should pull over to the side. And I did. Now, what I just described normally happens like that. It, I just snapped my fingers for those of you who didn't see my hand. Um, it, but that's not how my brain was working anymore. Everything was slowed way down. And I don't know if that's what happens to um, patients or people who have, who have been... Um, uh, dealing with uh, dementia, but that's what happened with me with my brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, uh, can you, do you want to answer that? Does do you feel like that with your own mind at times? Do you have that kind of pause? Well, I could relate to most of what she said, but <clears throat> not her driving experience. Uh, I, I don't think it actually happens that way for me. It, I think the problem is we can't process multi things at one time, and that I can relate to. Uh, you know, if you're working on multiple tasks, you can't just think of them as you would have once been able to think of multitasking at one point in time. You know, think think of three or four possibilities all at one time and figure that process out. Uh, you have to do one at a time and concentrate on that one. So from that perspective, I can correlated to that, but not where she described as doing each step individually and, and, and doing that. But that's what happens when I do normal projects around the house. I, I may be able to focus on one part of something, the task that I need to do, and I might have skipped on another task mm -hmm. because I wasn't thinking mm -hmm. about it, and I can't think of all the different tasks involved. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I don't like to do painting anymore, things like that, because it involves many different tasks of thinking, and I don't always think of all of them. Okay. Okay. How about you, Harry? 
um, her description of driving or kind of that pause in between steps. Is that something that, because everybody with dementia is different. Everybody with brain injuries is different. Um, but it's, I think it's just a good conversation to have. Um, have you, have you had any of those kind of symptoms? Yes, absolutely. Now I don't, I don't drive anymore. So, um, uh, simply because I'm an unsafe driver. Now, why I say that is, uh, I have a tendency to, to drift to the right. Okay. So if I'm driving down the highway, I might drift over in somebody else's lane. Okay. Things like that. Uh, if I come up to a uh, multiple lanes, I can't decide which lane to be in. Even though I know if I'm going to turn left, I should be in the leftmost line or lane. But uh, at, at the time, I'm not processing that. Uh, now, I, I think I think if you have a, a, a TBI, it depends on what part of the brain is is injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, like uh, if the if the uh, if the part with motor skills and things like that, that's going to be different than than uh, than me because uh, being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, the part of the brain that is that affects me is 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 the part that does memory, mm-hmm. uh, things like that. So uh, I have a harder time processing thoughts, and so even though what she described uh, described in driving. Uh, I probably had I, I would probably have the same thing, but for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything you want to add, Michael? No, no. I, I, I think what Harry said is right. I, I think we're it's very different. You know, you know. In one case, you know, she received a bang to the head. Where for us, it's very different. That it's something that's slowly happening over time. You know, and. I guess in her instance, it was an instant thing. Where for us, it's a gradual progression to that. Mm-hmm. So that could, that that in itself would be scary. I mean, you know, you know, it's one thing when you're slowly building. You know, uh, you're, you're starting to forget things, but the, all of a sudden to go from one day being able to do everything, and all of a sudden you can't do everything. I mean, that's got to be pretty scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was scary, and and it actually did get worse, too, over time. So I saw myself uh, lose my balance, and I started falling down and skinning my knee, Um, things I hadn't done since I was five years old, and and right away I'd want my mom. (laughs) I'd think, what's wrong with me? Why would I want my mom? I'm in my 30s. Um, Or uh, let's see, what what were some some of the other things? Oh, I remember one day um, after returning from Europe, um, which I went, I went on a trip I had planned um, for several months, uh, just a month and a half after the, the brain injury, which was not a good idea. If you have a brain injury, don't do that. <laughs> it was very hard. Um, but I was at my sister's on the way back, and uh, she told me there were apples in the refrigerator. And I went to the fridge, and I couldn't find them. And I went back to her and said, I can't find them. And she said, they're right in the front on the top shelf. So I went back and looked again, and I, I still couldn't see them. So I went back to her, and she looked at me, and she's like, they're right on the top shelf. She got real impatient with me, and she walked over to the refrigerator. She opened the door, and she pointed to the top shelf in the middle, right in front. And there were two green apples. Mm-hmm. But I could not see them before because my brain would only go to red apples. So to me, they were not apples. Okay. And that's and, and mine was a closed brain injury. In other words, I didn't actually hit something on the outside. It's that my brain sloshed inside. Mm -hmm. And so mainly the front left um, cortex was impacted. So decision making, uh, I I had a lot of trouble with decision making. I can relate to what you were talking about there um, with whether or not to turn left or right. That day I told you about with the driving, that's the day I stopped driving for about two or three months because I was afraid I might hurt someone. Um, and, um, and I didn't always understand what was different with me. Mm -hmm. Other people sometimes would tell me. Okay. Now you had said, you know, that you, um, took a trip out of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, were there, were there, apparently there weren't red flags for you. Were there red flags from other people? Did they make comment or, or did they just look at you going, you know, from the outside, you look okay. 
Well, I looked great. I looked mm-hmm. fine because I didn't have any outside physical injuries. So m- most people didn't realize that there was something wrong with me. I, I almost wish I had mm-hmm. because then they would have been um, maybe more concerned. And everyone was used to me traveling. I used to travel for work all the time. Mm-hmm. And, and I was used to me doing that. So I thought, well, I should be able to do this. Mm-hmm. But once I got over there, it was a whole nother story. And I managed to do it, but it was very stressful for me. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> One of the, the things that I hear from from Michael and Harry and, and um, others with dementia is um, it's pretty common that people say, well, you look okay, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And um, Harry, do you mind kind of commenting on that, um, you know, you, you look okay comment? Because I think that that's a huge thing that, that people are kind of up against in terms of, of figuring this whole process out. I, I won't even let you see what I want you to see. Uh, I don't want you to see my my dementia. Uh, that's why uh, when you when you look at us, we don't we don't do anything out of the ordinary uh, that that you're going to notice it uh, because that's what we do look normal. I mean, <laughs> it's. It's a part of the brain that that we're processing things. That that's what our problems are, in in that field. Uh, so of course, when you look at me, um, you're not going to see a physical change in me. But when you talk to me, when you sit down and talk to me, mm-hmm. then you can start seeing that I have problems with certain areas. Maybe uh, I. I have I have problems finding the words I want to say, mm-hmm. things like that. And if you understand this disease, you pick up on that right away. But but for the layman that that doesn't know very much about about dementia, they will never ever pick it up. I mean, it's just like, okay, he's getting home. You know, we, we can we can overlook that. Mm-hmm. How about you, Michael? Any comments on that about how people view you kind of looking from the the outside in? You know, do they really see what's going on inside or do they just go, well, he, he's dressed well, he, he, he looks fine? Well, most people don't know I have it uh, when I talk to them uh, and uh, they're very surprised about it. But I like to tell people because I, I, I rather them know than to have uh, high expectations, and then uh, I, I guess they find out differently. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the same with somebody who has uh, a brain injury. I, I don't know if you shared that with people, just like I shared. I, I do it because I know there's a lot of skill sets that have been impacted, and I'm kind of ashamed at times because of it. So I, I, I kind of let them know as an excuse of why I'm having them. So that's why I share that. I don't know if that's the same as somebody who uh, has a brain injury. Do do you tell people that you have a brain injury with the idea that over time you're going to get better and that you're looking for them to help you or something? Well, that's that's a really good point. And um, I have to say, initially, I didn't tell people because I didn't really understand everything that was wrong with me. And so I did. I just figured I'd get better like in a month. Mm-hmm. But after a month, uh, that's when I had to take medical leave. And then I figured I'd be better in two months. And I can remember that day with the apples. Um, everyone was used to me being you know, very self-sufficient, independent, um, high-functioning, um, and, and intelligent. And my sister looked at me that day, and she didn't mean anything by it. But she's like, why are you acting so stupid? And all I did was start crying. Because I couldn't answer that question. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know. Um, and it didn't make sense to me that it was from just getting rear-ended one day on, on the way to work. Mm-hmm. Because I because to me, I looked fine. So I couldn't understand why this was still happening. So that's a really good point, And I wish I had told more people. But people, I lived by myself at the time. 
which was very unfortunate because it kind of left me floating around. There weren't people checking in on me regularly. And my friends traveled a lot like I did. So we would sometimes, we just didn't see each other as much as we normally would because we were such travelers. And it was just kind of an unfortunate um, set of conditions of my life at that point in time. The average person who lived with a family would probably have had more people noticing those things faster. Mm -hmm. So let me ask um, Harry and Michael this question. When, when you first started noticing symptoms, did you tell anybody at all? I mean, even prior to diagnosis, Harry? Uh, in, the, in the very beginning, I did uh, because I was, number one, I was devastated by, by my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I put myself in that, in that end stage without realizing that there's, there could be a lot of time in, in between. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now times have, times have changed so much because uh, now my life is an open book. And it's an open book because I want it to be. I want people to look at me and say, he's had dementia for 12 years, almost next week will be 12 years. Uh, if he can do it, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do it. I, I try to lead by example. Uh, now, everybody's different. We all, we all know that. But I know so many people, uh, after I'm talking someplace, so many people came up to me and they said, you know, Harry, you look normal. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and they said, I can't believe that you had dementia for 12 years. That gives me hope. Mm -hmm. And that, that's my message I'm trying to get out. Okay. How about you, Michael? Um, when you first started having symptoms, did you share with people or, or not? I, I did, Lori, at the very beginning. I, I was a perfectionist, so I, I realized early on that something was not right. I didn't know what it was. I mean, I didn't know I had dementia. I, I didn't know I had Alzheimer's, but I knew something was not right. And I would seek to tell others about some of the issues and get some of their feedback. And most of the time, people just kind of came back and blew it off and said, oh, this happens to me too. You know, and I kind of just blew it off, you know, for the longest time, thinking that it was just normal and other people were experiencing the same issues. It wasn't until probably about five years, six years later, after going to doctors and everything, uh, that my wife was finally starting to see some of those things. Even though I had told her about some of those things and we were going to doctors, she really didn't see all those problems. It wasn't until later on that she was able to start to piece all these different things that were occurring mm -hmm. in my life as part of the problem with dementia rather than really knowing it was a problem at that time. Like, for an example, you know, I, I used to do all the planning for our vacations and everything. Well, I slowly get, started giving her bits and pieces of that responsibility to her over time. But it was a slow process. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it as it be, because I had the dementia that I was doing it. But now that we go back and look at it, that's exactly why I was doing it. So mentally, I, I, I wasn't doing it purposely, but I was doing it because my skill sets were being impacted, and I realized it, and I just was slowly turning that functionality over to her without really knowing I was giving it to her because of my, you know, problems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, you know, I just, I, I think, you know, it's, um, I think this is just an important conversation about how do we approach things you know, in a respectful manner, and mm -hmm. and even um, if somebody has issues, like your sister saying, why are you doing such stupid things? I mean, mm -hmm. how painful that had to be when you don't know. You know, you might not even realize you're, you're doing things different, and then um, to be told that they're stupid. And I'm sure your sister didn't mean it in a hurtful no. manner at all, but these are 
this is a big conversation. Well, and keep in mind too, my family hadn't even been around me. Mm -hmm. I I was just visiting at home for a couple of days. So they had no idea how severe this was. And and I went back to where I to Denver. I was living in Denver at the time and they continued to be relatively uninformed. Um, In fact, just the other night at, at our Christmas celebration, one of my sisters said, you had a, you had a brain injury. (laughs) And I I thought my whole family knew, Mm -hmm. but, um, I did start telling people later and, um, I was living out in Denver. Um, and so people out there knew, but I also didn't want that to become the story of my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to focus on that and what was wrong with me. I, I, my goal was how can I heal or how can I, uh, accommodate or adjust to this change in, in who I am. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which, which makes a lot of sense. I think it is kind of almost comical though, that you had a family member who didn't even know. I know it even now. And it's been like 25 years. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I, I, I can see that happening in my mm-hmm. family, you mm-hmm. know, because it's just, it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, they, they don't understand the impact of it. And I looked fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you're traveling out of the country, so what could be wrong? Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, how did that go for you, traveling out of the country with a brain well, injury? Well, like I said, don't do it. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I lost a few things while I was gone. Um, I got a little bit confused, but it also forced me to ask for help, and I wasn't a person who usually asked for help. So I now see that as a real positive thing that came out of having that injury. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've recovered most of what I had, but there, I think in many ways I'm a better person for all of it. I'm, I think I'm a kinder person. Mm-hmm. I can even be more patient at way more patient than I used to be because I, I used to operate at such mm-hmm. a fast pace. And now, um, I, I can operate faster than I did after the accident, but I don't need to anymore. Before, I thought that was part of how I needed to be. And so I hope I'm a much more compassionate person now, too, uh, and, and less judgmental, because there's so much we don't know about other people, and it's taught me to ask a lot more questions and reach out for help when I need it. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, Harry, do you think that, you, that having um, dementia has changed your life in terms of how you look at the world, you know, like Susanna saying that she feels like her brain injury has made her more compassionate. Um, do you notice any difference? Absolutely. Um, I hate that. I hate to say it, but, but it's the way I feel that I feel so blessed because of the lessons I've mm-hmm. learned living this disease. Um, now, why I say that it is in my prior life, uh, I was a workaholic, uh, and uh, I wasn't focused on what's important in life. And um, my disease has slowed me down to a point where I was forced to look at myself, and I was forced to to make a decision that um, I've lost so much. Am I going to keep losing things? Yes. Am I going to adapt to these changes? Yes. And um, I think I think the the things I've learned is it, it just makes me so happy because uh, uh, I see things completely different than than I did before. Mm-hmm. How about you, Michael? Do you think the disease has has changed your outlook on life, or you know what what are priorities to you? It definitely has made me more compassionate, uh, you know, and, you know, the, and also the sad part with this disease has also changed my behavior to a point that I've become a Dr. Jekyll at times uh, mm-hmm. because I snap out uh, and that's uncontrollable. So well, on the one hand, there's good that came out of it, but on the other hand, there's bad that came out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the one thing I do notice, uh, I, I'm more sensitive to people with disabilities now than I ever was. And I think part of it is because I can pick up for one reason or another when somebody else has dementia out there. Like we were just in the store, you know, going down the grocery aisle, and my wife 
and I were go, both going down, and this one lady was, you, you could tell she was just kind of lost and looking, and just, my wife was kind of like fast-tracking, wanting to go past her and everything, and I was just staying in with the cart, letting her, trying to find her time mm-hmm. to look at the shelf without trying to interrupt her, and that's not what I would have done five years ago. Mm-hmm. I would have just zoomed right by and, you know, excuse me, you know, but I've learned to, I guess, look for people like that who are in need of help and things. Okay. Well, and I can, I can say for myself as a care partner for my mom, I, I think, you know, that's one of the biggest lessons this is, and I've always been a compassionate person, but it, it, it has totally gone to a whole new level. And, um, you know, being able to step back and reprioritize and not think that everything on my list has to be mm-hmm. done, mm-hmm. Um, that the world actually will spin without me, you know, I, and, it, and it, that sounds pretty egotistical. But I think a lot of us get trapped in that, that I have to do this and I have to be this person and it's got to be done in this time frame and, you know, or, you know, what will happen. And we've never sat back and go, not a damn thing. You know, nothing's going to happen. You know, the world will still get by um, if you do things differently. And and that gives you such a, anyways, it did me such a sense of relief and, and a sense of calm, you know, to, to not have to feel as pressured. And so it's, um, it's the disease has given me a lot of lessons mm-hmm. in terms of what's important and what do I really want out of my life and who do I want to be around and what does that have to look like? Um really changed changed things up a, a ton for me. I uh, see a real gift um, too from my friendship with Donna because I'm I'm slowing down even further because I have to with her to um, when she's having like struggling for words. Sometimes mm-hmm. she has trouble getting words, and um, and I get to be more patient, and I just let her know, don't worry about it. Just take your time. It's okay. And that's good for me too. It's not mm-hmm. just, I know it's not just helpful for her. It's also helpful for me to continue to slow down because like you said, nothing's that important. I have plenty of time. Yep. Yeah. We have more, more time than we think we do, even though we're always watching the clock. And, and um, I know for me, I, I, I got to the point where I could turn my phone off when I'd go visit my mom and I never did that. You know, I always mm-hmm. had to be connected and, or, or I could leave it on and just not answer mm-hmm. it, which, oh, my gosh, I, I would have been twitching before, <laughs> you know, just a nervous wreck of, sure. you know, I have, to, I have to be connected at that level. Um, one of the things, since we're talking about um, compassion, is, um, Suzanne, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, how to communicate with compassion and advocating, you know, t- to be successful. Um, can you talk a little bit about your philosophies regarding that? Well, um, again, it comes to being as respectful as possible includes asking those questions. One of the things that, um, and I, I talked to my girlfriend, for example, before coming here to talk today, and I said, is it okay if I talk about some of what you and I have experienced? And she said right away, she said, yes, absolutely. So um, um, I thought it was appropriate, though, to ask her that because I, I don't want to speak out of turn and... and um, and she was fine with that, and I appreciate it. But um, sometimes uh, she'll she'll just go oh, <sighs> like that. Mm-hmm. And um, when when she's having trouble with getting a word, and so I'll say, okay, now what does that mean when you say? <sighs> mm-hmm. And and for some reason that she can then talk, mm-hmm. and she'll tell me what it what it was that she didn't say before. Mm-hmm. So um, asking what does this mean or what would you like or um, or how can I support you um, has been a really good question. And sometimes she doesn't know exactly how I can support her at that time, but she'll tell me later on. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. Um, also, I'll ask her if she wants some help with something mm-hmm. or if she wants a suggestion instead of just like offering it to her, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which I could very well do. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And most of the time she's, she's ready to hear something, but sometimes she's like, no, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. So asking questions more and not assuming is really helpful. Also, um, 
it's easy to step in for her and I don't, I don't want to, to take away her independence in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always easy to, to help people out, especially when you care for them, but sometimes that's not the most caring thing we can do. So I, I've been learning to be, um, slower to, to act on her behalf. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would love to hear what the guys have to say about that approach. So um, Michael, I'm going to let you go first on, um, on that. Before I touch on that, I'd just like to touch on one thing that she said earlier. Sure. She, she feels that she's got a lot of time and to be able to, uh, wait to do things. Mm -hmm. I'm on the other hand, I don't feel like I have the time. Uh, so I think that's where we, we think a little bit differently. I, I need to get things done quickly because I know I don't have time. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a really mm -hmm. good point. Really mm -hmm. good point. Especially when you go in and get a diagnosis and they give you a timeline and then, you know, um, and then like Harry's, you know, and so many others are, are that timeline's being pushed out. I look at my mom, you know, 30 years, you know, that wasn't supposed to happen and stuff. But um, with more early diagnosis and more support, I think we're going to be seeing that much more often. But again, it's an unknown. And so it's, it's still scary and you want to accomplish and live as fully as possible. Um, so what do you think about, um, you know, her approach in terms of, of asking and, um, and helping somebody? I, I think that's the right way to do it. Uh, you know, people are always so quickly wanting to jump in and take over because it's quicker for you to do it that way. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Hey, you know, my wife can get something done in five minutes. Uh, that it might take me, you know, 25 minutes possibly to do. Well, yeah, you, you can get it accomplished quicker, but at the same time, that would be defeating the purpose, and it would just slowly take my skill set away even more. Mm -hmm. Because by me not being able to do something or work on something, uh, that's just going to help me deteriorate quicker. Uh, and I think it is important to allow the people to still try to do things at their pace, Mm -hmm. And even if it requires some guidance and some extra help along with them, but you should allow those people to try to do that. Unless they plainly say, hey, look, I can't do this, help me, then step in and do it. Mm -hmm. Harry, how about you? Do, you? do you agree with what Michael is saying? I think, I think Michael is right on. Uh, I, think, I think our care partners handicap us by doing too much for us. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't. They don't leave us do things for ourselves. So they don't like to see us fail. Uh, I think I think the biggest thing you have to learn with compassion is you have to learn the art of listening. Okay, you don't have to do anything when you when you visit somebody that has dementia. You don't have to talk. You just have to be there with them. Mm -hmm. And and that and that's so important to have. You know, People think that that okay, we have to talk, but but I may be at the point that I can't process, I can't process, uh, I can't process anything that you're saying. So it's just kind of like uh, gibberish to me, you mm -hmm. know. But but the person has to talk, and if they will just sit there and, and maybe maybe hold my hand or just listen to me, let me talk, mm -hmm. let me talk. Now, don't help me talk, but let me talk, whatever. And a lot of times I'm not going to make sense, but that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just listen. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I would like to add is um, the listening, but I think we have to listen not only with our ears, but we have to listen with our eyes and picking up, mm -hmm. picking up all those nonverbals too, um, that people ignore. Because there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of language going on with gestures and, and eyes and smiles and, and all of that kind of stuff, body um, posture and things as well. So, yeah, I, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, <clears throat> Suzanne, how about um, keeping family and friends kind of involved and in the loop? What, what, what do you recommend? I mean, it, some of your family knew you had a problem and some of them, you know, didn't at all. Um, looking back, what, what do you, what would your advice be to people? And then we'll hear from, from Michael and Harry as well. 
Well, I realized I was in an unusual situation and that I was gone. And my, the rest of my family lived far away in another state. And um, main, the main problem with them was they, did, they didn't know what was really happening, and I couldn't tell them mm-hmm. uh, unless I saw them, and even then I couldn't always tell them. So if, if you notice a change with a family member, speak up. Mm-hmm. And reach out to them. Um, I wish my family had known to do that. Then they just didn't know. They thought I was doing well um, because they didn't hear much from me. Mm-hmm. Um, they just figured I was busy, busier than usual. Um, but that wasn't the case. Also, um, asking the questions again and and reaching out f- for help and. Sometimes it's kind of, you know, we all have roles we play in our family. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Mine was to be okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I wasn't suddenly. And um, sometimes we don't want to see those things. And so sometimes we kind of just have to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And then um, see what, what would be helpful. I know there are many more resources now for brain injury, um, uh, than there used to be. There are rehabilitation services that they might have been out there before, but they weren't very visible to me, or I'm sure I would have eventually found something. But um, reaching out, um, getting more involved in the public. I, I withdrew from, from the public because it was hard for me to be around people. Mm-hmm. But staying out there and involved in programs. So I, I think it's really helpful if family members advocate for their loved one. And get them involved in activities, uh, find out more and do research so they can understand more. Um, it, my family didn't know there was anything to understand, really. They mm-hmm. didn't, just a couple of them, and they didn't think it was very severe. But family members can do a lot of research. We're so fortunate now. We have the Internet, we, and we have a, a, a lot of other um, organizations that advocate for people and, and are informing and educating. And that is a huge plus, um, for, for family members. And then also, um, continuing to invite and include, um, their loved ones, even when it looks like they don't, they don't interact in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. I know I wanted to be included even when I couldn't interact. Mm Mm-hmm. Does that answer? Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Michael, is there anything that you would add to to what Suzanne is saying, or um, maybe thinking of ways that uh, it would be better, to, you know, for you in a in a different fashion um, to connect with family? No, I think she uh, actually said it very beautifully there, and uh, I, I can't stress enough that family and friends really need to. Be aware of these minor changes that they see in people because these minor changes that we sometimes just overlook, these are probably changes that are actually occurring that we could help identify to the person that there's something actually going on wrong. You know, uh, sometimes you do something really stupid and we just kind of think, oh, okay, it's just one of those things. But it may not be one of those things. It may actually be a reason for concern. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Harry, how about you? Anything you want to add there? I see it. I see it a little bit different, Lori. Uh, if you if you speak to anybody with the with dementia, and you ask them about their feelings, and one of them is abandonment, mm-hmm. they feel abandoned by their friends and family. Uh, now, there's there's a reason there's a reason why they abandon you. Maybe they don't understand the disease. Maybe they can't cope with it. There's all all different kind of things. But uh, speaking for myself, I can't I can't reach out to the people that abandon me mm-hmm. because it it hurts too much. You know. Now that's the message that that I'm trying to get out to the families that you don't know what you're doing when you abandon. You love one that has some form of dementia, mm-hmm. you know, because we cannot recover from that. I mean, it's not like you kiss and make up. That doesn't happen. Uh, we once you feel that abandonment, uh, it's it's never the same. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Michael, any comments to what Harry just said? No, none at all. Okay. Well, great. And can I add just two mm -hmm. concrete pieces, or are we running out? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, there, just because of the work I've done with people and uh, legacy from some of the other work um, in, um, from my past, uh, making sure that... All right, here's an example. Um, my girlfriend has, she went one day, just went in for no apparent reason, just decided to change her, her um, uh, passwords on her accounts. Well, at least that's what her family thought. And when I asked her why she had done that, she said because she couldn't remember her, her passwords on her accounts, so she had to change them. So now that we, with, with computers, um, which is something we didn't used to be interacting with on a regular basis, and, and all of the, the accounts we have out there in the, the universe of the Internet, um, it, it's helpful if we make sure as family members that we keep track of account passwords. And also um, another thing that she's had um, happen recently is some uh, phone scamming mm -hmm. that's happened, and and money mm -hmm. was withdrawn from her one of her bank accounts because of that, and um, and so uh, fortunately her husband caught that, and it's all been remedied and taken care of. But sometimes uh, she she can be more easily um, persuaded to do things. Okay, and so I would just like to encourage people to make sure that they help. Um, their loved ones with things like that too. Well, and that's a huge problem, you know, out there with scams, not just people with dementia mm -hmm. or brain injuries, right. but um, as a whole, I mean, those guys are so smooth out mm -hmm. there. I have a girlfriend whose mom was hit up and what the police said is once you're on one list, they sell you to others. Mm -hmm. And she had people not only calling, but coming over to the house oh. um, to get money, doing business deals. And, and, you know, she thought, they were legit, and she ended up having to go to court. I mean, it, it, it one of them got really, really bad. And um, we find um, real quickly how our banking system is not set up to protect mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Harry, have you, have you um, had difficulty or been hit up by scammers at all? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's... That's why I'm not allowed to carry any any cash with me or credit cards or stuff like that. Uh, I've had I've had people call me up um, and you know trying to sell me something, and uh, uh, I end up telling them that I have dementia, I have no use for that, mm -hmm. and and uh, they they sometimes say, well. If you give me your credit card, I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very, very helpful. You know, give me all your information and I will help you. Mm -hmm. And and having the mention, I mean, you can sell us anything. Uh, that's why that's why I don't carry money. Number one, because I can't I can't tell the difference between them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, number two, you can sell me anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if you give me a sad story, I'll buy it. Uh huh. How, how about you, Michael? Have you had any any problems, or do you have a more difficult time discerning a, a good deal versus a bad one? I definitely become a lot more gullible. Uh, I mean, I could tell you, I was the one who could pinpoint a scammer out there instantly. Uh, where now, I I no longer can easily do that, uh, and. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's because of my dementia or it's just because I'm in such a public eye at this point in time, but I get so many people trying to reach out to me and uh, phone calls and things like that uh, that they're, they're always trying to scam me for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to be very careful with that, and uh, I tend to make sure that anything I do do that looks questionable, I, I'll get my wife involved just to be on the safe side anymore. Yeah, that's... That's smart to do, and it's a good mm -hmm. discussion for families to have mm -hmm. um, openly. I mean, it's I, I, you hear people who um, who have no dementia, who don't have any brain injuries, and they're getting scammed. Exactly. So th this is just um, you know, but you you just become more vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, with that. So 
um, you know, there shouldn't be um, embarrassment um, with something like that because it is something that, that definitely needs to be watched and, and protected. I mean, you're talking about your lives, you know, so um, very important. Um, and, and one way, one simple way to help with that is to make sure that your loved one's phone numbers are on the do not call list mm-hmm. or, or on the do not, I think it's the list, the federal list mm-hmm. for do not call because that can help limit some of the potential for that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Well, well what scares me is what happens when I no longer am capable of thinking to do that? That's that's the scary part. Mm-hmm. Now I'm able to figure these things out. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, this has really been an interesting conversation. Um, Michael, is there any question that you'd like to ask uh, Suzanne before we before we um, end the show here today? I, I guess the only thing I, I I'd really be curious to know is. Does she have what I would think as a hope factor that she's definitely going to be getting better and improving by working things over? Because a person like me, I don't have, at least speaking for me personally, I don't have a hope factor anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I know what's written in my cards. I know what's going to happen unless they come up with some miracle drug over the course of the next uh, year or so. I would think as a person who's had a brain injury, they they must have a huge hope factor because I would think they're constantly trying to improve. And hopefully, uh, again, I don't know what somebody goes through trying to improve over time. And, and, you know, it's different for every person. I'm, I'm glad you asked about that. As a matter of fact, I can remember um, my neurologist saying, Oh, Suzanne, your MRI was, it, it was the best MRI I've ever seen. And I said, okay, so what's wrong with me then? <laughs> if it looks so good, what's wrong with me? And, and, and how soon will I be better? And he never told me, I don't know. Um, I wish he would have, because that would have been helpful. He'd said, oh, well, within three years, you'll be maximized as far as what you're going to get back. Well, I noticed that I continued to get things back, but it was at a very slow pace. And when I say slow, I mean over 10 years. That's that was pretty slow for me, um, and I'm I am fortunate. I regained more than most people or a lot of people do, but I also still have deficits, and I also know that because I've had um, probably two concussions in my life because um, I, my my I have had impact injuries in the past as well that I I stand a higher than average um, likelihood of developing dementia later on in life. So um, while I got a lot back, I still have things that I that are challenges for me. Paper, for example, um, <laughs> and uh, I have more clutter than I used to have. I I never had any. Now I have less than I previously had since the accident, but, um, I don't know that I'm getting any better, but I don't think I'm getting worse anymore. And I got for a while, I, I got progressively worse. So, um, I have, I hope now that I won't end up, um, dealing with, um, more memory issues in the, in the future. But if I do, I have a lot more information than I had the first time, and I have a wonderful example from Lori and you gentlemen and my girlfriend and so many other people that I'm meeting um, through uh, the memory cafe that I'm attending and some, and a lot of the other activities that I'm doing. So I, I do have hope, but it's hope that... Um, that I might get lucky again and not end up um, with more loss. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, Harry. Did you did you have anything that you wanted to ask Suzanne before we before we sign off? Just just one thing. Uh, I think I think this is a wonderful conversation. I think it opened up the doors for a, a lot more conversation about that because. We don't talk about brain injuries. You know, uh, very, very seldom does anybody, well, that's that's fixable. Mm-hmm. And it's not. It's not fixable. You know, people with brain injuries have the same problems, with similar problems than what we do living with dementia. And uh, I think conversations like this is very important 
because um, people get to know what it's like to have a have a brain injury versus having dementia. Yep. And you find that they're so similar. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's why, actually, why why I was happy to be able to share today because I hope it helps family members too to understand a little bit of what might be going on um, for for any of their family members who have dementia because it it's it looks real strange from the inside. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see the words, but I couldn't get them out. Mm-hmm. Um, or sometimes I could get them out, but it was the wrong word. Or I, I wanted to say mountain, but all I could say was big hill. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's a, like I said, I, I just think this has been a really interesting conversation, and I appreciate all three of you taking the time um, to share with us today. Uh, we had a little late start just due to uh, computer glitches and stuff, but we have uh, <laughs> Mr. Calm over here in the in the audio booth, Wyatt, who has just got us all up and running and and got things all fixed. So uh, he's our technology wizard, so I have to give him a big shout-out here. He's just been great to deal with. Um, Suzanne, how can people get a hold of you if they'd like to talk with you further on this? Um, the best way to reach me is at uh, wellmentalhealth at gmail.com. Or, well, actually also, or at my phone number, 651-314-1890. Again, that's 651-314-1890. And I'm, I'm sure you'll have information that's available, too, in case people need it. Exactly. Yeah. And, Harry, um, for you, how would you like uh, people to get a hold of you? Do you want to give a plug for Forget-Me-Nots? Or? Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I don't answer my phone. I don't read my email. So it's... Uh... Uh, I depend on somebody else to uh, be able to get in touch with me or, or let me know if somebody's trying to get in touch with me. But uh, do forget me not is, is, is the best way. Okay, and forget me got not is a closed group on Facebook. You can always go through me as well. Um, Michael, is there is there anything that you want to give a plug for or uh, contact information or just have people contact me and I can I can connect you or... Well, they could reach out through my website if they like, uh, michaelellenbuggenmovement.com, and through that I have a contact page on there. Okay, wonderful. Well, again, thank you all so much for your for your time today. It's been a great conversation, and hopefully uh, it'll hit a lot of ears um, around the world and, and help a lot of people. If you didn't listen to the last show, we had Dr. Richard uh, Finker on, and we were talking about improving lives with dementia uh, through technology is one of his specialties. Uh, next week, we're going to have um, the director of the film You're Looking at Me on. And uh, so that'll be a fun, fun conversation. Our next Dementia Chats will be January 12th, and we're going to be using the Zoom platform for that. We just had our last one on the 22nd, and I'm still working on getting that posted. I have to do things a little bit differently and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on trying to figure that out. But we'll have it all down pat by the 12th and, and have things up and running. Um, if you are looking to um, go to one of the, the movie screenings of His Neighbor Phil, um, I'm going to be out in Seattle in February. Uh, we're going to be doing quite a few um, premieres out there. Uh, we're also going to do one January 24th here at uh, Polar Ridge Senior Living. Uh, so just uh, give me a shout out or you can visit the website to get more details on that. Um, past blog posts I want to point out is uh, we've just gotten some beautiful comments by a poem that was written by uh, Rita Gerard called Mama's Hands. And uh, it's just a really touching poem about her mother and reflection of her hands and who who she was uh, throughout her life. And... Um, and what she she meant to uh, to Rita as her daughter. Um, let's see. We had another post just talking about remembering the holidays aren't about getting gifts um, or, or or getting presents. It's really about being present um, with one another. And you know, we touched on that today about that whole slowing down and just uh, really engaging and being respectful and not having to to move at such a fast pace. I want to wish everybody a happy new year and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks again. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. 
Hey everybody, Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire, become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.